Now we are going to be, we are going to loosen one of the assumptions about the variance to become a bit more realistic about things. Generally speaking, the assumption of knowing the variability, the 0.2 squared in our play example, will generally not be given to us out there. When we're in a practical situation, we may not know this variance. So we have to face the fact that we don't know it. We start from scratch and we have no information of the variance whatsoever. That's the more typical situation. The other situation does occur, but this one is more typical. So we have to compute the variance. So what's the big deal? I mean, I already taught you back uh, some weeks ago that, of course, we can compute the variance given that we have some numbers. We'd make 25 drives or 16 drives we planned now. I can compute not only the average or the mean, uh, I can also compute the variance. Here is the variance formula, almost as it was given to you in chapter two, with a slight little difference here that I have used in this version of it. I have used capital letters, capital X, capital X bar, and capital S squared, emphasizing the challenging fact maybe for you now that a variance is not a certain thing either. Or I should be careful now in my wording here. The sample variance, the computed variance, the S squared, will also change from sample to sample, right? If I take a new sample of 10, 16, 25 drives, the variance computed of the numbers, the new numbers, would be another variance, right? So a new sample, a new variance, a new sample, a new variance, right? So the sample variance, the variance computed, computed on actual numbers, will change as a random variable that changes from sample to sample. This means that when we're gonna do the obvious thing here, the obvious thing is, again, maybe you have to get used to why we're actually looking at this construction here. I would, let me uh, re rephrase it. The construction from before looked like this. Sigma root n. Why do we look at this? This is because this is the mistake we are making. This is the error, right? This is the difference between what we compute and the truth. X bar is going to be used to infer about mu, right? X bar is going to be the estimate of mu. So we should be concerned with how far away from mu is X bar. X bar minus mu, that's the difference. It's a deviation between what I use and the truth. Have you seen a few good men? <laughs> With Jack Nicholson, Tom Cruise, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> I'm trying to say truth the same way there because I love this uh, quote. Um, if you didn't see it, go ahead and see it. It's an old movie. I saw it in an auditorium hall in a university in the US back many years ago when it was out. Nice experience. People was cheering up at that side can't handle the truth. <laughs> okay. Sorry for the stepping aside here. Difference between what we compute and the truth. Not exactly, it's standardized with the variability or the standard deviation of this measure. So we have a standardized measure of the error we are making, right? Now, we cannot use the sigma as it comes. We are going to, of course, plug in the computed sigma, which we now call S squared. We're going to plug in the computed variance instead of what we before assumed to know. So we are going to plug in the S here. And then we basically, it's the same thing, it's just putting in the computed variance instead of the known variance, then we don't call it a set, we call it a T. And why do we call it a T? Because here pops up a new distribution to us. If we look at this construction now, it's no longer, generally speaking, normally distributed because we cannot assume the variance known. We plug in something that comes with a noise. When we plug in that comes with a noise, the variability of the whole system will increase. So we have a new distribution. The standardized error we are making 
does not follow a normal distribution anymore. It follows a t-distribution. The theory is telling us that. What is a t-distribution? Actually, there are many different t-distributions. One for each number of observations, possible number of observations, actually. Sorry, wrong way. Here's the t with 11 number of observations. That is 10 degrees of freedom. Can you see the difference between this and the normal, the major difference? Well, here it is. In Danish, we have a not so nice word, which I don't know now I'm being recorded, but uh, no, I'm not going to say it. I mean, I'm getting old. Let's not say it now. Question? Once again? There is a difference, if I may uh, phrase it slightly differently. You have the difference that we see actually is out here in the tails of the distribution. So the upper one, in fact, the upper one, that's the T, and the lower one, that's the set. Of course, you couldn't see that or couldn't know that. The T distribution has, <laughs> the T distribution has uh, longer tails. It's, a, it's more variable. I thought, why is that so funny? There you are, thanks. Um, but I, I mean, I'm used to people laughing at odd places where I didn't expect them, so that's the story of my life. Um, the T distribution is a distribution that looks very much like the normal, but for certain cases, we must use the T to get the right probabilities in the tails. It can actually influence the tail probabilities substantially for a small number of observations, for a large number of observations, not so. We have table four for the T distribution and we have T and R, of course, T and R. Let's try to use it and then have a look at the R and have a look at the table. Now, in the example, we do 16 runs as the planning phase told us to do, then now we, we, we no longer rely on knowing the variability of the system. Uh, so we have this funny say that we don't, we have an unknown variance, but unknown variance means that we compute the variance from the numbers. And then here's another minor mistake, but actually, strictly speaking, we should use small a squared here when we claim a number. Uh, we use capital S squared in the theoretical formulas, but we use small s squared when we have a sample variance, like in chapter two. Now, let's try to do the same thing as before. Let's, let's compute this E 0.95 using the same formula as before, but using the T percentile instead of the set percentile. And we use the computed standard deviation, and we use root N. Right? So we need to find T 0.025. Let's find it in two different ways. Let's find it in table four first. I increase table four a little bit here. Table four says values of T alpha, like the set, we have values, connected values of points on the x-axis and right tail probabilities, the right-hand end of the distribution. First of all, we average. There are many different T distributions in this single table. Table three is two pages of numbers just coming from the standard normal, right? Table three is like two full pages of numbers from one single distribution. Now, the T distribution is much less densely uh, informed to us here. We only have that's uh, we only have one row for each T distribution. There are many different T distributions. For instance, when we have n equals 16, new here is like n minus one in the computed average. So when we have n equals 16, it corresponds to new equal 15. Right? This is the n minus 1 in the variance formula, you could say, coming up here. Um, 
So we only have this row of information that is relevant to us about this t distribution that we should use in this example. All other numbers are irrelevant now. Only, what is that, seven points in the distribution is given to us. However, these are the, some of the important points. Let's see if we can see the headings, if we can do that. The relevant heading in the task we were given here is the point 025, right? So the point 025 was giving us the number 2.131. In R, we do have the T distribution exactly like we have the normal. There is a T, for instance, QT, Q for quantiles, the inverse of PT. So if we say I want the 97.5% quantile, I have to put the DF, the degrees of freedom, to be 15. I have to tell the function which T distribution I am I interested in here. And no surprise, I get clearly the same number as the table, 2.131. That is 2.131 times 0 0.25 root 16. Of course, I prepared this also in R. Here it is. Here is the 2.131. Here's the 0.25. Here is the root 16, right? Square root 16. The number become, becomes 0.133. Ah, well, what's going on here? I just planned an experiment such that I would obtain a maximal error of 0.10. You now I performed the experiment, and the, and the maximal error of the experiment coming out actually became 0.13. That's bigger than what I planned it to, to be. Why? What is happening here? That's the other question on the slide. Can you explain that? Anyone can make, it's not a major explanation, it's just a little observation we have to make. Related to the topic of this little section, yes, please. It's one? The actual variability that we are estimating from the data came out larger than what we thought was the truth. Then, of course, we could discuss if we really believe the other thing is the truth, then, of course, we might use another formula. But this formula given here is given to us such that we don't have to rely on assuming anything about the variance. So it's a formula where we don't rely on this assumption of knowing anything, anything but what we can observe in the same numbers that are given to us that we are having in the experiment. That's what we are using. We, we will be less, I mean, we have less information. It, it's not as good to estimate the variance based on 16 observations as it would be to know it for sure. Knowing it for sure is like estimating it with infinitely many observations, right? And we don't know, we don't do that with only 16. That was the T distribution which we use when we have to estimate the variance, which we have often. I'm just going to finish off this part. Actually, I want to show you in the bottom of the T distribution, in the bottom of the table for the T distribution, you can see here, this corresponds to n equal 30, right? That is degrees of freedom, 29. Then they make a big step in the table, jumping from 29 to infinity. That's a pretty big step. What does it mean in terms of the T distributions, how do the T distributions change from 30 up to infinity? Let's look at one of the headings that we often use. This is the third one from the, for me, from the left. Um, this is this one, alpha 0 0.025, the 2.5% two and right, uh, uh, right hand side uh, tail point. I hope you recognize this number coming up. I mean, it only changes from 30 observations up to uh, infinitely many observations. The 2.5% point in the T distributions only change from 2.045 and it converges to 1.96. That is such a little change, so that's why we call, whenever we are beyond 30, 
n is large and we don't need to worry about the t when n because that was the central limit theorem again actually when n goes beyond 30 i mean this row in the table is like the standard normal row this part these numbers can be found also in table three this is a subset of table three very small subset seven numbers of all the many numbers in table three the last row of so the t distribution becomes closer and closer to the normal as n increases when we are beyond 30 we are as close as we want to deal with in practice right so beyond 30 we can just use the normal distribution anyway so the t distribution is primarily important for small samples for large samples it doesn't matter we could just use the normal anyway even though we compute the variance that was the let me see That was the unknown variance discussion. 